People that are most shocked by the cost of Teslas tend to be the frugal people who buy older cars and keep them for a long time to sort of get that depreciation cost to almost nothing. And of course, that's a really sensible thing to do if you want to keep costs down. In this video, I'm going to reveal the true cost of ownership of a brand new Tesla, and the results are incredibly surprising. It's been a very hard video to make, to make all this data digestible, and hopefully agree it is full of surprising numbers. And at the end, I'm going to run through three additional bonus simulations, including what happens if the Tesla battery pack fails outside of warranty and you're left footing the bill for that. So this spreadsheet approach is a very interesting way of revealing the true average monthly cost of ownership for all things considered over the period of time that you own the car, which is of course the true cost to you. So it's the most important number to look at. The cheapest car we've ever owned was a 10 year old Subaru that we paid 900 pounds for and it had a blown head gasket. So over the course of the eight years that we then kept that car, we spent about 7,000 pounds in repairs. But even with that repair cost, it was still the cheapest car we've ever owned in terms of depreciation and repairs. The average monthly cost for that was less than 100 pounds for, for all the depreciation and all of the repair costs associated with that car. I think most people would agree that's a pretty low cost of ownership for a vehicle. So let's have that as our benchmark. Of course, there are running costs on top top of that and that's where things get really interesting when we're comparing the EV with a petrol car. Unfortunately you can't get a 10 year old Tesla for £900 so we're going to be looking at things quite differently. So first let's get to the bottom of this depreciation and repairs because that's the main difference between buying an old car and a brand new one. Running old cars is really interesting because what it means is you're actually happy driving around in say 15, 16, 17 year old vehicles. So if you want to compare that with the true cost of ownership of a brand new car, you need to assume that you're going to keep that brand new car until it's the same age as your older car. And this has a really interesting impact on the depreciation cost. Of course, if you're running an older car and it's going to be hitting those older ages, you're going to be dealing with repairs. I've made a spreadsheet that shows shows this effect. Now keeping a car to 18 years is pretty extreme and because we're talking about EVs and the long-term understanding of what the battery degradation is going to be like when they reach that kind of an age is a little bit unknown. Let's just dial it back a bit and we'll say 14 years is our maximum age. The other benefit of doing a calculation like this is it makes it much easier to estimate the cost of depreciation with a short-term life cycle the, the volatility of your markets and all the rest of it can really impact that depreciation if you put the wrong number into your spreadsheet because it's a short period of time it can really throw out your monthly averages by quite a lot and you could you could really get this wrong but over a longer period of time you know that the bulk of the value of the car is going to have gone by the time it gets to the end of that life cycle so you can just put in a really low ball number at the end and you'll get a reasonably accurate average even if you're off by a few thousand pounds at the end of the life cycle over the 14 years that isn't going to change your average cost very very much. So we've got two main comparison vehicles in the spreadsheet here. The first is a brand new Tesla kept for 14 years and we're going to assume that we can sell it for £10,000 at age 14 and it's hard to know how accurate that's going to be. It may even be slightly pessimistic given the way inflation is going and the demand for EVs and all of that stuff. And the old banger car that we're going to compare to is a 10 year old Subaru. Uh, looking on eBay at the moment they seem to be going for about £6,000 and we're going to assume we're going to keep it for four years so that it's the same maximum age in both comparisons and we'll assume we'll get two and a half thousand pounds for it when we sell it at that age. Obviously there's quite a difference between my original benchmark of a 900 pound 10 year old car with the blown head gasket here, the 6,000 pound 10 year old Subaru we're going to assume is pretty much mechanically fault free and of course that was a long time ago versus now. So we're looking at these two vehicles because they're basically both quite good family cars with all wheel drive and safety as a priority. So the next thing we've got to do is we've got to set up the assumptions we're going to put in for our repair costs because obviously we're going to be owning these cars outside of warranty in both cases. We're going to assume that neither the motors or the battery are going to fail in that 14 year period. I don't think that's an unreasonable expectation. I think if batteries and motors were failing on EVs inside 14 years it would be a pretty big deal. But obviously there's a lot of other stuff after the first four years of ownership which is where the main warranty runs out that you're going to be exposed to. So let's just put down £8,000 because that's a, quite a long time. You've got 10 years outside of warranty for all of the non-battery and motor components. So I think £8,000 is probably a reasonable figure to put in here. Remembering that this is the total cost of repairs over the whole life cycle. Just, that's just a way I've set the spreadsheet up here. It makes it a bit easier to kind of come up with these numbers. So with the Subaru, we're keeping that for a shorter life cycle. So that total repairs over your ownership period is going to be lower. So we'll put in 2500 for that. Obviously, the whole of that period of ownership is outside of warranty. But it's an older, cheaper car to start with. It's a bit more of a known quantity. And obviously, it's, it's kind of generally cheaper to repair an old petrol car. You can see with all of this, I'm being 
being fairly conservative with my estimates. I'm not trying to frame this in any way to make it look genuinely appealing for the Tesla. The real magic happens without fiddling the numbers here. Remember at the end, I'm gonna change the numbers to show what happens to your average monthly cost if you do get something like a battery failing on the Tesla inside your ownership. So now we can see in the spreadsheet, we've got a comparable monthly figure, which represents the true cost of ownership of these two vehicles. The Tesla's still quite a chunk higher because we haven't put the running costs in yet, but maybe still not quite by as much as people think. So let's get stuck into the running costs. And this is where really interesting things happen in terms of average monthly cost when we're comparing different life cycles, primarily because with petrol, you are paying that every month. It doesn't matter if you have a short life cycle or a long life cycle, you can't do anything interesting with that average. It's just going out of your pocket every month. Seems like there's been a load of videos coming out lately where people are saying that diesel cars are cheaper to run than electric cars. And all they're doing is doing a long road trip and comparing the cost of the diesel with the cost of all the public fast charging. And of course, public fast charging for an EV is a very expensive way of charging the car. I think if you were thinking of seriously getting an EV and only expecting to be charging it with public charging, you are going to have quite a shock. It's not really going to offer any kind of saving. I think we are going to need a, a big price difference or a different kind of technology before it starts to make sense for people who can't charge overnight uh, on an off-peak rate at home. For fun, at the end of the video, I'm going to put in the numbers as if we're assuming all charging is happening on an expensive public charger, and we'll just see what kind of impact that does have. I find it a bit annoying that these videos are coming out because they're basically propagating two myths about electric cars. Uh, one is that the experience of charging an electric car is in any way similar to filling up a car with petrol. And that leads people to have these kind of discussions and thoughts that uh, an electric car should be able to charge as fast as a petrol car, uh, which is kind of missing the point. And the second point is if you think running costs are similar between electric and petrol, then the price difference of the vehicles themselves starts to become a problem. Both of those issues are not the case. So even in the middle of an energy crisis, the cheap off-peak electricity rates overnight uh, is 10 pence per kilowatt hour, which is obviously a lot less than you're paying in the daytime. So if you can charge at home overnight, this really changes the game. Basically, because the car's already got the energy that you need for the driving that you're gonna do the next day, for most kind of social uses for a car like this, you don't need to be using superchargers. We've only used them a few times over our ownership. So what we're gonna to need to do in the spreadsheet is split our miles between the cheap rate overnight charging and the smaller portion where we are gonna be using superchargers, which cost about 60 pence per kilowatt hour. Of course, at the end, we can easily switch the spreadsheet to zero miles on the overnight rate and 100% of the miles on the expensive rate and we'll see what kind of impact that has on the monthly cost. Obviously the number of miles you do each year has a big impact on these monthly figures. There's going to be a tipping point where it starts to make a lot more sense uh, than if you were doing fewer miles. So what we're going to do is 14 and a half thousand miles a year. I think that's fairly reasonable. It's certainly easily what we're doing in the Tesla and interestingly we're actually doing that because of the Tesla. So we were, we were kind of throttling ourselves because of the cost when we were running petrol. Now that the per mile cost is lower, we're finding ourselves easily doing those more miles. So it's nice to, to be realistic about the miles that you that you can do uh, because that kind of shows where the benefit really lies. So in the spreadsheet, we'll split this and we'll say that a thousand miles per year are coming from supercharging at that, that higher cost and the rest are coming from cheaper off-peak charging at home. And this is where we start to see some really interesting figures coming out of the spreadsheet in terms of that monthly running cost. Of course, this way of looking at the true cost of ownership is not without a caveat. You do still have to buy the car, uh, even though over the spreadsheet, over the, the full life cycle analysis, you can see that the monthly figures are quite interesting and, and you know, genuinely uh, reasonably sensible. You do still have to find the money to pay for the car in the first place. And obviously you're not gonna get somebody to finance the whole value of the car over your whole 14 year life cycle. And that's the problem. So Tesla do offer finance over six years. So that helps a little bit, but basically you're cramming all of your depreciation into the first six years. That's the point at which you have to have bought the entire vehicle. Obviously, in reality, you've got value in the asset at that point. So the spreadsheet reveals that you haven't actually spent all of that money, but your bank balance has lost all of that money. So you do have to find the money and the cash flow issue is the main point, I think. I think that cash flow problem is a big one and that is a genuine problem with the fact that EVs are so expensive. But it is nice to know that at least if that you can make the cash flow work, you are getting that true cost of ownership to actually be quite a sensible number. So because obviously with the petrol car, you're paying for the petrol every month, that is an expensive outgoing cost for the entire life cycle. So when that's reduced, you can obviously move that money into the repayments for the car for that first bit of your ownership. So that kind of helps a little bit, but it generally isn't enough. You know, it is obviously gonna be more expensive for that first part of your ownership 
of the EV and then cheaper at the other end and it's the average of those two sections that makes this work out in real life. The interesting thing about expensive monthly repayments though is that because the warranty is running over that period of time when you're repaying the loan you haven't got to be thinking about unexpected repair bills while you're paying those higher monthly repayments so that's quite an interesting cash flow uh, kind of situation as well and that's actually the reason I don't like the idea of a PCP product when, when I'm buying a car like this because it means you're just about to hand over a large sum of money just as the car's going out of warranty so if you were to get a loan for that large sum of money at the end which a lot of people do and obviously we want to keep the car past the PCP term to get the best value um, but the reality is you'd then be paying off the balloon payment over the period of time of ownership where the car isn't under warranty so you may then get a large repair bill on top of that that's when it all starts to get a little bit risky so essentially I want to own the car completely by the time the warranty runs out so a six-year loan from Tesla obviously it's in between the four-year full warranty and the eight-year battery and motor warranty so there's a little bit of risk near the end of that period of time but after that six years I won't owe Tesla anything for the car and I know that the value of the vehicle is just mine and I can sell it and recoup that value as needed. It's also worth noting that when you keep cars for a long period of time, the impact of doing more miles is less. If you do loads of miles over a four year PCP plan, you, you pay for that at the end of the term as quite a serious penalty. But if you're keeping it for 14 years, obviously it's gonna change the value at the end, but you're working with much smaller numbers at the end. So the impact to your average monthly cost is much less. So let's just say we did loads of miles and instead of the car being worth 10,000 pounds at the end of its 14 year life cycle, it's only worth 3,000, just kind of must be pretty much a scrap value for, a, for an electric car with, with motor that run that additional £7,000 expense over the 14 years only equates to £40 a month more. You can have a pretty drastic impact on that figure at the end in terms of percentages and it doesn't change your monthly cost very much because of this longer life cycle. So let's explore some funny simulations that we can just change the numbers in the spreadsheet here and see some interesting stuff happening. So the first one we'll look at is what happens if the battery fails. This is obviously one of these things that everyone is worried about with an electric car, you know, outside of warranty. The battery is so expensive, if, you, if it fails under your ownership, you're kind of stuffed. So let's just put something into the spreadsheet and see what that really looks like. So let's say we get to year 10 of our Tesla ownership and the battery fails. You're out of warranty and the battery's what, gonna be 20,000 pounds to replace and you decide, you don't want to spend £20,000 fixing a 10 year old car and you decide to sort of scrap it and cut your losses. So let's say you get £1,000 in scrap, which I think is reasonable for a Tesla with two working motors. So in the spreadsheet, we can change the maximum age to 10 and we change our disposal value to £1,000 and we assume there's not going to be any other repairs because we're only just out of warranty. We're assuming the battery failure is going to be the one major repair that, that scuppers this whole plan. So in that simulation, you can see it's actually only costing you another couple of hundred pounds per month. I know it's a lot, uh, but it's still when you frame it like this it isn't quite as dramatic as you think it might be and that's of course even if you scrapped it if you were to actually just pay the twenty thousand pounds and keep it for another 10 years knowing you've got a brand new battery you could think in terms of keeping the car longer then really interesting things start happening again so even in that kind of dire scenario things are not actually as bad as you'd think so let's look at another scenario. I think a lot of people like the idea of changing their car every four years. The idea of keeping a car for 14 years is quite daunting. So we can look at the Tesla guaranteed future value on a four year PCP plan to have a kind of baseline worst case scenario. How much is the car gonna be worth after four years? So we can put that in as our disposal cost and change the length of ownership to four years. And we can see the, the cost impact difference there and it's quite significant. But what you've got to think about is you're getting a car with an average age of two compared to an average age of 12. So you're driving around in technology that's drastically different between these two scenarios and you might find that the extra cost associated with that is good value to you. So lastly, let's just look at what happens if we change all of our charging miles to come from public superchargers instead of the cheap overnight charging. And I think, again, a lot of people are gonna see that number as being fairly representative of, of the very different experience you're getting out of these two kinds of vehicles. And it's not insane, but I think the real problem there actually is the hassle of using supercharging as your only way to charge an electric car. I think if you were to do that, you wouldn't really see the benefit of the home charging thing, which is just such an amazing uh, sort of workflow experience. Um, that that's where the real benefit of an EV comes, especially when it brings with it that low cost of ownership. Hopefully you found this as fascinating as I have. There's nothing like justifying an expensive purchase with some good sound economics behind it. Check out this Model Y review next that I've done. And here's some comments to, to show you that it's gonna be worth your while and I'll see you there.